And the uh, first question I wanted to ask you is what do you prefer, St. Louis spare ribs or New York City pizza? <laughs> well, I got I got Dr. Roderick, you ready? Yes, sir. All right. Tyler, you ready? Let's go. All right. Time out. Tyler, who are we taking the time out with today? Well, thank you, Kevin. Today we're taking the time out with Dr. Roderick Jones, president of Goddard Riverside Community Center. And uh, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for being on our show. And the uh, first question I wanted to ask you is what do you prefer, St. Louis spare ribs or New York City pizza? <laughs> well, I got, I got, to, I got to go on the side of New York City pizza. You know, I, I love the, I love the grease and I love the pepperoni. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I haven't trouble finding any of the New York style pizza in Rochester. We all, have, we're all about thick crust up here. Give me some of that Brooklyn style, New York style thin crust. What's the best spot you found down in New York? There's a place called La Familia. And it's still it's still one of those places where you can go to and get a piece of pizza where it's really greasy and enough cheese, you know, where you can bend it in two and flat, like it's the perfect pizza. I'm the sandwich guy too with the slice. I, I know exactly yeah. the fold method is what it's all about. <laughs> it's a science to the fold. You know, it's like reading yeah. the New York Times. You know, you gotta be you gotta be able to fold it in the right creases. Exactly. Right I think it was in a long came poly where they uh, started patting the grease and the guy was like, gotta, "What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, you don't do that. You gotta you gotta save the grease for the crust. Dab it with the crust. <laughs> You guys are making me want to lick my fingers over here, but I'm, I'm more of a rib guy being from the filthy, dirty South. So, uh, Dr. Jones, I wanted to ask you, um, out of Rochester, St. Louis, and New York City, what's your favorite spot to live in? I have to say Rochester. You know, during my time in Rochester, it was good to me. You know, I, I think of some back to the days when I was a young guy kind of coming up the ranks and the amount of support we got to do good things for kids. It was just a city I, I loved. Love, love, love. We'll take that. We'll take that. I know Tyler uh, was a syndicate. I'm a syndicate. I'm not from here either, but uh, the, the amount of things that we have in Rochester, and I think I heard a stat that we're the most nonprofits per capita in the entire country. So it's uh, it's a very philanthropic town, and and a lot of the work that you're doing is more on the philanthropic side, but you, you, you've had a ton of um, education. So we do not use the word doctor lightly because you got about 20 years of experience, but it looked like you started in criminal justice. Did you want to get into any reason why you started there and what, what, what led you to where you are today? Yeah, oddly enough, I, I decided I wanted to be a judge uh, years and years ago. My mother was a clerk in the uh, criminal justice system, and I wanted to be a judge. And then I got to school and realized that I'd have to defend things I didn't believe in. And I was thinking, I'm not going to do well with that. So, so I uh, wound up um, uh, working for General Electric in system security IT and then uh, left there and decided I wanted to go to Rochester where my friends were from where I went to school and stumbled into a little settlement house, uh, Genesee Settlement House and loved it. I loved working with kids. And from there, it's just been kind of 30 years of working in settlement houses and loved it. That's it. Can you, can you um, touch on, I guess, uh, how did you find your way to that first uh, project or the first settlement house that you, uh, you got a part of? Yeah, so you know when I when I left General Electric, I was I got to Rochester and, and was looking for a gig and went into the Department of Unemployment. They had an advertisement for a counselor, and you know the I love while I loved the work, it was in terms of pay, it was about a third of what I was making in corporate. Um, but I just couldn't um, I couldn't resist making sure other kids had a chance like I did, and I loved it. I remember when I first over the summertime we worked in summer camp. And some of the kids were special needs kids. And I remember there was a, a little girl, her name was Catherine. And this little girl wouldn't let anybody help her. And of course, I was the one that would have to go and get her out of the water. And I cannot swim. I got <laughs> proof I almost drowned in Brazil, like completely drowned, like making peace with God, that kind of drowning. And I was thinking, this little girl wants me to get her out of the water. I'm not really sure why, but you know, I'm taking both of my feet in my hands. Oh, oh, God. All right. Well, before we get into, because I know there's a lot of stuff that Tyler and I want to ask, um, I want to get a little bit more about who you are as a person, um, because I think it's important to all know that we share so many similarities and differences. 
I know Tyler is yeah. a big music fan. I'm a big music fan. I think you can learn a lot of pe about people from the music that they listen to. When no one is around, Roderick, and you're singing in the shower and everybody's out of the house, what song are you singing? I love Whitney Houston's. Oh! I want to dance with somebody. It's like this song. Yep. Yep. I tell you, it's a go-to. It's a go-to. <laughs> <It's a go -to. laughs> Dr. Jones, I was thinking over here, so you got out of GE, which was probably be a bunch of that Lean Six Sigma crap over to the more heartfelt, you know, really life-changing um, oriented job in the counseling world. Uh, do you have a, a best story or a favorite story of, of a kid that you've seen go from nothing to be he heroic? I tell you, I, um, not just kids, but a part of, a part of, you know, when people say to me, you know, what, what are amongst the things that are like a highlight of your career? Uh, when I was in Rochester, and this is another thing I mean about living in Rochester, that when I say it was good to me, um, I had a staff of young men that we would hire really with similar backgrounds as mine, but some of them even tougher situations where they had their hard knocks and we were able to hire them and work with them and train them. And I had one particular young man, um, Jamal, like this is the guy who, who honestly brought me to tears on more than one occasion. Um, we hired him. He worked for one of my fraternity brothers who worked for me. And I mentored my fraternity brother under me who has the same master's and doctorate as I do. And he grew up in the projects there in Rochester. And the other young man followed him. He was on Dean's list for, for four straight semesters before going to four year. You know, and I, while I have a lot of education, I sometimes have to say, I think I recall you know, being on Dean's List, but I really wasn't on that Dean's List that many semesters. But this is a guy who, you know, who had been shot like several times and was the best youth counselor ever. And just his academic attainment and work attainment was something that is proof that it doesn't matter where you started, like with the right amount of support, you can get there. And this was a guy who would bring me to tears all the time. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. Dr. Johnson, what drove you to get so many degrees back in your day? Was it was it all self will? You know, my mother was a my mother was a stickler about education. Like, there's two things that get you killed: <laughs> lying and stealing together, and skipping school. And so <laughs> we were just avid readers. Like you, you know, we grew up in a tough neighborhood, so we had the You guys may not remember the encyclopedia. We had the full version with the atlas. And you know that it was we were pretty regulated around education, and so it was just I just learned to love I love learning like you know it, it's like I love to read I love to learn, and that's so powerful because I think it helps us to continue to learn throughout life, right? It's, it's, it's a constant evolution of finding yourself and finding what you want out of life, and sometimes it's maybe just hiding in a book that you never read and you you just picked it up, and then all of a sudden things start to click. Um, something uh, that you talked about in uh, one of the talks uh, that Tyler and I um, had the opportunity to listen to, obviously, before bringing you on as a guest, you talked about the great lengths. Like we've all had the parents that I walked to school eight miles. It was uphill both ways, nine feet of snow, right? But you actually had to live something far different than that story. Can you talk about that story and that journey of what it took for you to get just to get to school? and why that was so important to you and your mother, um, as well as your future success? You know, I think, I think sometimes people, when they think about poor, low, poor and low-income communities, they often forget that the vast majority of that community is made up of people who want a better life, who want to work towards a better life, but may not have access. And then all the other, they often miss the other challenges just to live every day. And you know, one of the things you you one of the things I talk about sometimes to people is to, is what it is like growing up in a really challenged community. How you have to really have a strategy every day just to survive, um, and that's not even do something doing something magnanimous with your life. It's just getting from one place to the next. And so you know, growing up in Brooklyn and the housing projects, you know, you had you were always on guard. You had to be careful about what you said to somebody what other people said to you so you're not confused with other kinds of activities. And so, I mean, simply going from, from my house two blocks away to the store 
was an exercise. And just think about being a kid, how much mental duress that is. And it's the same going to school. And so oftentimes I think in, um, you know, it's too important for people to realize that low income communities are made up of people who are low income. And oftentimes those low income people are subject to an element. But the vast majority of those people are, are well-intended taxpaying Americans who really work every day and desire something better. Um, I think the other part of that is, it's important to remember that if we want a better society, that we have to, it's important that we bring other people along. And I, I'm a firm believer in personal responsibility, but the reality is, is that you can't pull yourself up by bootstraps when you don't have straps. <laughs> And I, and I know you talk about like, obviously all, what we can be doing to ca like cast that net to raise other others up. And you also talk about, I didn't get to choose my parents, right? You didn't get to choose yours. We didn't get to choose the background that we grew up in. You called it the winning, um, the birth lottery. Can you go into that idea and what you talked about? Because I, I you just, I'm a new father myself and I, and it just really hit home for me because it was just like, holy shit, you're right. I have to tell you, you know, I've lived in more than one part of the, of the country, and I'm astounded sometimes when people start to talk to me, particularly younger people who live out of a set of privileges. It's, it's almost this very um, staunch extreme of everybody should just be able to do it, and everybody should be able to do it on their own without support. And when you start to, when you start to unearth the experiences that the person is talking from, you realize that I'm thinking, really, you hit the birth lottery. Like you're, you're, you're giving instructions on how to get from home plate back home again when you started like feet from home base. Like you don't know what it is to struggle or to go to schools that are failing or to schools that don't offer AP programs or what it is to have to survive getting to school. But it's, but it's important to realize that for some kids, the odds are stacked against them. And sure, can you make it? You can make it. But I think we have to, the reality is, is that there's work to be done in terms of, of a, a give, allowing people an opportunity to reach their fullest potential. And I think that, I think that you know, you, we can talk about trickle down economics and all those kinds of things which I have not ever seen work. But the reality is, is that when we present a solid foundation for people to boost themselves up, then we all benefit. The tax base benefits, the wellness of society benefits, generations out of poverty benefits, but that's the only way we do it is collectively together. And so what can guys like Tyler and I be doing today to get behind that message and, and lift others up with our net? You no, know, I think I think you asked the right question. Like, it, like I don't think this requires you to be a scientist or even to be from a particular community that has challenges. But it's about being involved, right? It's about helping to hope for people who don't yet have hope or understand, or help to build perspective for people. Whether that's basic mentoring, whether that, and we're not even talking about money. I mean, basic mentoring, tutoring of kids who may be in schools that are failing. Um, creating opportunities for kids to have exposure, you know, coaching on teams where kids are able to interact with other kids from other economic backgrounds. And then there's your ability to make contributions or join boards for agencies. Most people don't realize that not-for-profits are all run by volunteer boards. And everybody, you know, I often say this to people, I don't care if you're the homemaker that knits blankets all day, which I probably shouldn't be so pejorative because homemakers have a hard job you know, taking care of kids, but there's a lot of wisdom that you learn about taking care of your kids that can be shared um, for, in other ways, program design, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with kids, but everybody has something that they can offer, right? And I think, I think that's the reality. I mean, it, it comes with the cost of democracy, right? It's not just about having free right to vote, but it's about collective ownership of society and community. Don't just complain all the time. Oh, you know, these people are sucking up American society. Do something. Yeah. You're bringing it back to the Dr. Jones. Uh, my mother always said uh, we were born on third and thought we hit a triple, you know, uh, is when you were talking about that couple of feet away from home plate when you're born. Yeah. And uh, I remember back in my day, I had AAU practice at uh, Little Rock Central down in Little Rock, Arkansas. 
Oh yeah. And if you're familiar with that history, that ain't, that, that wasn't too pretty back in the day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, what? How how important do you think it is to educate our kids at a young age, kind of like my mother did on the way down to Little Rock? She would she would tell me the ins and outs, and I would be kind of be embarrassed a little bit on uh, what what happened at that specific school and you know others throughout the country. But how important and how do we educate kids at such a young age? And what are the questions that we can ask those kids to in order to spark that conversation and not be scared of it? Yeah, I think you know I think we teach kids civility, and I think we should remind kids of our successes and our overcoming, as opposed to making things out of shame. You know, I, I have three kids and I oftentimes um, make sure my kids understand history where we come from, so they have a perspective on privilege. Because the reality is, is that for every time we advance out of an economic rung, there's room to forget. And so, you know, I think about my kids, one of them Sometimes I have to remind him when he gets really critical about other people, about, about the fact that he started at home plate. Hmm. You know, you got to, you, when you have a parent who's in 0.0014% statistically at education level, don't assume that you just start there. You know, that, 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 that takes work. And sometimes we, I think particularly in this next generation of young people, we have to remind them, like like nothing is due to you. That that the that the block you stand on was built for you, and that took work to get there, because privilege is elusive, and we'll also will our young people start to distance themselves um, from the very things that they really need to understand. So some of the things um, that you talked about earlier too, you touched on the stress of the everyday life, right? Of, 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 a, of a man of your character and your integrity living in a part of Brooklyn that wouldn't that be ideal. And some of us might not even ever want to travel to, right? That amount of stress in your life, we're, we're starting to hear businesses now focus on um, mental health, right? Uh, the, the, the fear of burnout, right? But that's only with their job. And here you are living where you're living, going to school and trying to get that education to, to, to grab that hand to, to lift you up and, and, and get out of that opportunity. You talked about this time in your life where your parents had gotten divorced and how that changed because then you really realized from middle class going to lower class that you got to see the other side. We're all living such busy lives today, right? We have our kids. We're, we're, we're juggling so many different things at the same time. How do you help people to say, hey, take a step out of your busy life and stop making assumptions? Because I know you had said assumptions are a very dangerous and slippery slope for us here in society. Yeah, I tell you, I think, I think, I think we're at a good time for this kind of discussion. I think so often, and I don't know what it is about this time of pandemic, where people just seem to be jumpy, right? Um, there's two things that I'm observing. I think that people seem to be resolved that they're so sure about what they're sure about. And I've never, you know, I tell you, the, the more countries I visit, the more things I read, the more I, I question what I know to be true and absolute, right? And so it feels like in this day and age, people are so resolved that they're sure about what they're sure about. And what I realized, there seems to be a correlation between exposure. So the less exposed you are, the more convinced you are that you're right. So I think that's one. I think the other part of that is we have to open ourselves up and, and, and remind other people when we're in conversation and, and be that diversion thought that helps people to think about how and why they think about things the way that they do. It's not enough to just sit around and let people go on ad nauseum about things that, that, are, that, that are not substantiated, but we all have a responsibility to say to people, so tell me how you got to that. Like, tell me why that's absolutely true. You know, I grew up in a city where we have a resting population of 9 million people. And, you know, most people don't realize that the MSRVP of New York is 23.4 million. We have people who come to work here from, from Pennsylvania, from Delaware, New Jersey, from Connecticut every day. And so, you know, you live with people who speak I think if they say if you walk through Times Square, there's over 350 different languages. Wow. So what makes English like the, the only language in the world? You start to, you know, I have my own set of faith, but 
you know, how many different faiths are there in the world? You know, and, and every, you know, and so the reality is, is that it's so critically important. And I think this is at the core of American liberty that we help people to open their mind to reevaluate this sense of absolute rightness mm -hmm. to the point that is tied to their personal righteousness, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that that's a cancer. Oh yeah. And I think, I think unless we open ourselves up, we will often pass our opportunity fulfill, to fulfill purpose. You know, I tend to be one of those people that believe that each of us have a purpose. And, and sure, not, we may not all get a star in the walk of fame, but I, I just believe from a faith standpoint that the way God meets people's needs is not through a blue light flashing light, that oftentimes it comes through the goodness and kindness of other people. And so if we're so closed off to other people, how do you, how do you get close enough to people to hear their need to touch their life. You have to encourage encourage that. And I know you talked about, uh, again, you talked about some of the stuff that you had to go through with the Head Start program, right? And then you talked about your mom wanted you to go to the school at the other side of town, that sure. other school, right? And you talked about the journey that you had to take. Now, how easy would it have been if you were in that small, like you said, I, I, I love this fact, right? You and I are data guys, 323 million plus Americans today. Only 23 million of them have passports. But yet we believe in the American dream and the United States is the greatest country in all of all time without having that other perception of what else, how else are the, is the other world living? And I think, I, like you said, when we broaden that horizon and, and you talked about the importance of a Head Start program, because if you don't have a program like that, the world is very small and you get in your own way and you only believe that you are only small things are possible, not greatness. That's right. And, and even even learning is by association. You know, I, I think of all the time I've ever been in school, the class I loved the most was my fifth grade English language arts. And I remember I remember uh, my teacher, Mr. Rappaport, was teaching us about uh, weather and the differences in rain. And the fact that it can be raining in one place, but not raining in another. And I never really understood it until we used to go down south every summer. My, my mother is Southern and my father is Caribbean. And we would go down, some, go down south in the summer. And I remember what an epiphany it was when we were driving and it was raining. And then all, you know, and, and I look, we go through and it's not raining anymore. And I look back and it's still raining. And I was like, oh my God, what a revelation, you know? And do, those things seem simple, but that's the way kids learn, do exposure, right? It's, it's exposure. And so the less experiences you have, the harder it is to learn. Mm -hmm. How do we get exposure both ways, right? How do we, how do we take people out of their comfy, cozy environments of, of, of the east side, for example, of Rochester, primarily, everybody knows it's east side versus west side. How do we get people and make them uncomfortable so they can learn? You know, I think, I think you talk to people and you challenge them. Like there's, there's always opportunities, if, if not a one-to-one, -one, there's so many institutions like you said rochester per capita in terms of number of not-for-profits the not-for-profits are always beyond just service delivery they're vehicles for engagement and so there's always opportunities to say to somebody who's and you you should always target the person that's, that's the most sure for the trip for the field trip you know it's like okay well why don't we take a field trip and let me take you let me take you to a so let me safely take you on a tour so that you get to experience other people, you know? Because there's so many other people in the world, you would be surprised. They're trying to make it through this life just like you are. Oh, yeah. And we're probably not as different as we as we, we want to believe. I see more similarities than, than, than that. And I, I, I think that you talked about that, again, the American dream. My question to you with so much changing during the pandemic and Tyler, I know I'm doing all the talking and I'm on a run and I You're got good, it. man. Hop on the bus. Let's go on a big a little, a field I know trip I want here. to get on this bus with, with, <laughs> with Roderick here and, and do some of these field trips because I think that's how we can do some of God's work to really show and build, build, build those bridges that everybody talks about. Um, but you talk about affording or giving everybody in the United States the opportunity to live out the American dream. But with the pandemic that had just changed, that American dream seems to be changing right now, right? It seems to be really um, not what it once was as we see the mass exodus of people that thought the American dream was through business, through their profession, and through their job. 
but then realize that money itself is, is just simply an opportunity to bring about less stress in their life. What do you think the new American dream is or what should it be for all of us to get back to the, 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 the roots of which our country was founded? You know, I, I, think, I, think we, I think people shouldn't be dismayed by an event, right? If, if, if you keep it in context, we've had such events before. Um, you know, just, you know, I think about 2008 when I moved to St. Louis, I moved, I moved at the height of the, of the economic crash. And people said we would never recover, we'd never be the same. I think the reality is, is that, is that, is that who we are under the under the bottom is who we are. And I think I think there's still, um, I think people shouldn't be dismayed as if, as if we won't make a comeback. I think the reality is that we will make a comeback. I think that I think that what has happened is people, people have a different perspective, right? I think even we in New York have seen people who would have never seen themselves coming for help or on a soup line. I think that those people now have a readjusted lens to understand that we all are vulnerable, right? And so there are people who thought, oh, I'm so far away from ever being poor, who we've seen come and they couldn't get their minds around the fact that I can't pay my $7,000 a month rent, right? And, you know, New York is a whole different scale of when you talk about money. And so just imagine somebody who has a million dollar income and not only are they not getting their bon hedge fund bonus, but they don't have a job. And so they've got a million dollars worth of living expenses, two kids in private school, their car, their house in the East Hamptons. And the reality is, is that it's almost all gone. I mean, that's what we've seen. And so I think that it's not the American dream that's unattainable. I think that we all, we now realize that it's subject to something bigger. And I think that's hard for people to accept. Which I totally agree with. And I think that, and I'm, I'm going to talk about white men, um, probably some of the highest addiction rates that nobody else talks about, right? It's the highest suicide rates, right? There's this idea with us white men that uh, it's monetary, right? That American dream is monetary. When we get there and we achieve that because we were born on third base or fourth or, or hit a home run, right? With the birthing lottery. When we achieve that and they realize that that is not what at all is their purpose, then they turn to other things and really like self-inflict the, 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 the wounds or the damage. What do you think of what you've seen to really, I guess, take the next step forward together as a community, lifting everybody up together? Um, what are what what can Tyler and I, like I said, besides striking up the conversations, what other things should we be looking for in order to get involved with? What other friends can we bring along and, and things to, to, to really bring about that that commonality? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, I, I think I'm going to answer this question with part of the last question. I think that one of the one of the revelations that people have had in this pandemic is that money is not everything, right? I think you you're seeing. I was I was talking to some folks I know in terms of executive search, and a part of what they a part of what they were saying was that people are it's, there are people who weren't losing their jobs, but they elected to leave their jobs to do something else. I think in these moments when people realize that I was chasing something that has no meaning in the grand scheme of things where people are dying and losing their life, what is the net value of money, right? And so I think, I think now is a strike point where we get people to realize that there's a, that there's a, a need to focus on purpose and a, a ownership of our part in society as opposed to being so selfish and so inward focused because I think some of, I think also when you look at the, some of the other rifts, I think some of it, you know, you talk about, you know, I don't know what it is to be a white male in America, but when you talk about some of the rift, I tend to think to myself, you know, I've lived in other parts of the countries where not every white male is driving a BMW and living in a six bedroom house, you know, it's like, I can't eat tomorrow. And so I would imagine that if, if you've been persuaded that every white male has these things and you see yourself not having it, you have to feel awfully far behind. Yeah. 
And so I think we've placed too much, we place too much emphasis on wealth as if it is the definition of, of success in life. What happened, to, what happened to being personally responsible and raising a family and being a good person and working hard, right? And, and being a good citizen you know, those things still have value, but we've, we've, we've gotten to the point where if you're not rich, your life is worth nothing. <laughs> and I think that, I think we've created a monster in that. I do too, Dr. Jones. And I, I talked about this in our last episode. I, I get all tired and bored of asking people what they do for a living. You know, I, I could care less what you do for a living in a way. I really could. I, I'm more after what makes you happy. What's in that ticker of yours? to uh, get you out of bed every day and do, do the next right thing. So my question to you, I guess, is what was the happiest year of your life and why? You know, I have to say that that those days go, some of those days go back to Rochester when I was younger. You know, one of the, thing, one of the things I was able to, to lead and create when I was in Rochester was called the Rochester Step Off. And we, we had thousands of kids from across Rochester, both city and county. And it was, it, it, was, it, was, it was an opportunity to expose kids in the city who might not have otherwise be, been exposed to a college going culture. And the, many of those kids tracked right into college and they pledged fraternities and sororities. And then the kids from the suburbs, and, and I'm talking about kids even a majority of the color whose family were, were enculturating them all the time to education. They got to meet the kids on the other side of the track for whom they had all these impressions about. And it was, it was such a community and almost all volunteer driven. Like there was 200 volunteers from across a variety of schools that came together every year and it culminated in a, in a competition at the Blue Cross Arena. But it was nine, 1,900 people packed with not a single seat. But it would do the whole year was a collective community where young people were enculturated to realize that class and economics are not a measure of quality of person. Mm. But, that, but that this is about you working towards being great, not just yourself, but in the context of a greater community. And so, again, you know, I, I, when I talk about Rochester, these are the kinds of things that that I think in other places, it's hard to believe that young people, somebody at 20, 25, 26 can get that much collective community support. And that's the kind of stuff that gets you out of bed. You know, it's, it's, it's the purpose. I was gonna say the exact same thing, Kevin, about the purpose, you know, uh, Dr. Jones, what do you, how do you find your purpose if you don't know what it is or don't feel it inside you? What, what's a, a, for the very first step to find your purpose uh, for the young kids out there? Yeah, I, I tend to think that if 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 it's if it's what draws you and you're committed to, then give yourself over to it because you're probably in line with your purpose. You know, and, and I think it rolls out. You know, I, I grow I tend to believe that to every person has a purpose and that and that if you're following your purpose, that the, the preparation is there, right? So even the hard times, the things that are difficult are teaching us so that when we get to that place, we're equipped to do what we have to do. And I think that the other part of that is provision. Just trust that you're gonna, that you're gonna be provided all you need to fulfill the purpose. And I think when you're in that way, you have a certain amount of joy about every day and a certain amount of peace about all that you do. And I don't, th I don't think that that's only about um, being in the helping professions. I think that's the things that you guys do. If it's about being a voice to, to um, help people to think about how they think about the world, it's your purpose, it's where you get joy. It may not even be where you earn your paycheck, but it's, it's where you get your joy, you know? I, w I was just gonna say, uh, like finding, like you said, finding your purpose. And sometimes it can be scary to take that leap like you're talking about. I mean, you did it, right? When you leave the corporate world to, to then come into the nonprofit world, you, you left behind, you, you mentioned two, two, almost three X of your salary. A lot of people come to that crossroads. How did you decide to take that leap and say, you know what, it's not monetary, it's, it's more about passion for me? You know, I, I think I had concluded that, that my personal happiness is important to me. <laughs> and I think, I think this, is, this is what you're seeing through this life event of the pandemic. 
I think there's a lot of people who have just concluded that I can only wear one pair of shoes at a time. I can only live in one house at a time. I could drive one car at a time. And so I'm going to, I'm going to figure out how to be happy and not trade it off at the expense of riches. And I think that's, uh, I call it the bite of the forbidden fruit where uh, corporate America never really wanted us to taste that, that, that apple, right? That, that what work-life balance, the, the ability to pick up your kids at school during the half of the day or, or watch uh, Puppa Pig or some episode or a movie that they really wanted to watch. It's, it's those small life events as my son's crying in the background that really, I mean, changed my life, right? Fatherhood really changed my life. Um, and, and, and you, from your humble upbringings, right? The, the going through these events, finding people that were, were willing to take a shot or a chance on you, Roderick. Um, what would you tell people that are in search of finding a, a mentor? Um, what, what should they look for in a mentor? How do they find them? Um, and, 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 and maybe you can mention a mentor in your life. Yeah, I tell you, you know, um, I think the, there was a woman who changed my life forever, you know, and every, every Christmas I sent her a thank you note. And it was my former boss, you know, um, there in Rochester, Sherry Walker cohort. And, and she called, I remember talking to her and she, you know, when she called me about coming, it was my first executive job ever. And I remember when she called me, I kept holding the phone thinking, who's this lady talking to? Like, like, are you sure you got the right person? You know, I'm like, I'm like, like, you can't be talking to me. <laughs> You know, it, it takes you a while to reconcile yourself to the thing. And, um, you know, she, I worked in her building on a national demonstration project, but I didn't work for her. So the whole time I'm, I'm thinking, I would see her passing and, you know, I would talk to her, but I, I, don't, I don't know her in that way. And so that one reach out changed my entire trajectory. And so I think, um, I think for, for young people who are looking for mentorship, it's important, one, to remember, do your best always because people are watching you. Whether you think they're not looking at you, they're watching you. And be open, right? It's important to build relational collateral. There's a woman, Carla Harris, who works for uh, Morgan Stanley. She did an incredible TED talk about collateral. It's important to remember to when you go and you do something, do a little bit more because it's that that builds currency and then build relationships because it's other people who will make a path for you. I know we love to believe that we did it all ourselves and we showed up and we can make the stars drop out of the sky and the moon rise on our schedule. It doesn't work like that. Don't fool yourself. It's like, you know, it's like you drunk the Kool-Aid. Come on, you know, it's, you, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> Like you're, you're, you're like, it's lunacy sometimes when people, I'm like, it's not your own doing. Like you, you got, you got some grace and then you got some care, right? You got grace enough to be put in the right place and you, and somebody cared enough to give you a hand. And so I think, I think as, as long as you, you try hard, you work hard, you build currency and you open yourself up to have relationship with other people, it's the easiest way to run into people who are willing to, to give you a hand up. You know, those people, I, I, often say, I love it. Yeah, Tyler, I was going to say, you know, I, I'm often amazed at, at people, two groups of people. One is people who um, talk about being highly religious. And they, I'm like, listen, there's, there's few blue light miracles. If you really don't like people, I don't understand how you can love God and hate people. Like, it doesn't work that way. And, and, and I talk about that all the time. It's like they come out of church on Sundays and they're, they're going to run you over in the parking line. It's like, wait, is that, did you take a time out to actually listen to what the what, what the man was saying up there, woman? Wow, that war quick. Yeah, yeah. real so, quick. I got yeah. somewhere to be. I got breakfast to go to. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you, I'm like how, how does that work? I think it's the same as those people who expect somebody to show kindness to them and to give them a hand up, but you don't like anybody. You come to work and you don't want to talk to people. You know, I have, I have one woman who would complain all the time that, that you know people do people give birthday parties, and I said, you know, if you want if you want people to spend their hard earned money to give you a cake at work when you have a party, don't make people hate you. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's a simple equation. Like, show yourself friendly. You know, it's, it's not rocket science. 
Oh, man, I was just laughing about what Dr. Jones was saying. Uh, my, my quote is, Tyler White ain't enough. When people ask me about why I make so many relationships, build so many relationships, seek so many relationships, and for one, I, I like to know people's experiences to learn from. I, I don't really like, I'm not a very uh, a scholar by any stretch of the imagination, Dr. Jones. I like to hear it from the people's words, people's experiences. Sure, I can read a book, I can watch a YouTube documentary, whatever the case may be, but when it comes from the horse's mouth, you know, and I got a, a big old stable of horses behind me nowadays is where I start growing a lot. And I saw that you, uh, you have over 500 employees over there where you work and you're the president of that, that honcho over there. How do you make those 500 employees feel valued? Yeah, I tell you, you know, I'm, I'm learning more and more about the simple value of thank you and recognition, you know, we, we, uh, we've just merged with another organization. So now we're up to like 700 employees. Wow. And I, I tell you, it's, it's really difficult to get around like I used to and meet all the employees and in, in the smaller agencies I've run, you know, but, but I'll, I'll give you a simple kind of thing. Um, when I was in Rochester, we would send a note every, at the end of every year with a card and a gift card and a handwritten note to every employee and really we sent it to their family to thank them for the sacrifices the families made in order for them to help change other people's lives and and it was you know fam the families and the employees loved it i always thought that the the real the real kind of genius of that was the note that told you know told somebody's husband you know we thank you and your family for all the times when you're wife had to stay at work late to manage a crisis in somebody else's life while you're home taking care of your kids this person is making a sacrifice what i found is you know this year we gave all of our staff a 20 to a 25 dollar gift card and you would think that we gave them a million dollar check and i was i was telling my i was telling one of my one of my colleagues i completely underestimated the value of that one $25 gift card. And it, it wasn't, you know, I thought to myself, you know, I was the whole time I was laboring under the impression that it was the handwritten note. But the, the simple card to recognize that that we appreciate and thank you for your contribution in the lives of other people. And particularly in our kind of work, you know, so often, you know, and I, I, I say thank you to our staff, because when your own life is falling apart, divorce, kids, you know, living at the margin, all of those things when helping professionals give, when your life is falling apart, people still expect you to show up at 100% to help take care of other people's lives. And so, you know, I'm learning more and more that simple thank you goes a really long way. And just a simple recognition, I, that's an absolute true story. One $25 gift card, you would have, you would you would believe that that thing was like writing a million dollar check. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to get a hold of it. I'm telling you, I'm trying to get a hold of it. That's, I mean, but you said it's the power of uh, you guys taking and understanding the other side of their lives, right? It's not just work. And I think it's also like just sharing that um, you appreciate them, you appreciate other things that they're having to put on hold in order to help support the, the, the vision that you guys have, the settlement house there. Um, sometimes it's just that simple recognition or the simple thank you. Um, but, but businesses tend to think, think that it's all monetary. Um, but, and, and you're here, Dr. Jones, to tell us that uh, you're, you're, you're noticing some things differently on your side. What was the biggest surprise, I guess, when you moved into leadership, right? So you were, you were really at the front lines. We were working on projects. We were working with the people hands-on. And then you got that call that you had mentioned about for your first executive job. What was the biggest lesson that you had to learn um, when you first accepted that role? Yeah, you know, I think um, I think you often think that it's all about the simple caring, but it's a huge responsibility to keep the place going. You know, when you think about it, um, and and of course, my the scope of responsibility has grown from from the from two thousand to now. But no matter how big the organization is, it's, it's a reality that it's not about, what well, it's not solely walking around kissing babies and shaking hands, you know. It's, there's, a, there's an economics to it. You know, you got, you got a, a layer of people 
who count on you. Right now we have 700 employees who count on the place working well because there's another 30,000 people who count on them in order to, to move their lives forward. So in as much as you love to lean on the caring, you know, we are, we have a $50 million budget and there's a lot of people counting on the management of that in order for a whole bunch of people to be well. And so I think that was the biggest kind of, uh, kind of aha, like it's not, you know, it's not, it's not handing out mittens on, you know, at Thanksgiving, like this is, like there's a there's a business element of it that cannot be handed off, and that's as much that's as important as the caring. Jeez, well, Doctor Jones, when's the next time you come up to Rochester? I will actually be up pretty soon. My you know my sister is there, my kids are there, so I get up back and forth pretty frequently. All right. Well, if you wouldn't mind letting Kevin and I know, we'd love to take you out to lunch and pick your brain even more. Oh, yeah. For sure. I appreciate you guys having me. It's, I've had a blast. That would be amazing. Well, we're not done with you yet. Don't go anywhere. I got a couple more. So as uh, as we draw into the close of the show, um, I think uh, I we will probably ask you some of our stereotypical interview questions, right? Some of the questions that you might get to ask on uh, some of these 700 plus people that you're now uh, overseeing as the leader. Um, but before we do that, one question that I had for you is your humble beginnings, right? You got to see both sides of the fence. You got to see now the leadership of a $50 million budget. And then you go back to your roots with, with, with living and, and traveling to the other school. Do you feel like you're a more effective leader today because you do not allow your ego to cloud your judgment as to this was my idea, this is how I got here kind of thing? And can you, I guess, elaborate on that as how you constantly check that ego in the role that you are today? You know, my mother, my mother, you know, one, one of the, one of the, 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 um, the outline questions is, if you had to write a book, what would it be? It would be my mother said. You know, <laughs> all of my friends that know my mother, they always say, "When are you going to write that book?" And my, you know, my mother was, um, my mother was a, a Southern woman. You know, she she um, and she te she teaches through affirmations, affirm aphorisms, and colloquialisms, those kind of sayings. You know, and my mother used to say, "Always remember, there's a thousand steps up and only one step down." Right. And it's something that sticks with me. It's, it's important to remember that in all that you're doing and all you're climbing, it only takes one thing to send you spiraling down and to bring it all down. And so from my standpoint, I think that that's critically important in terms of keeping yourself balanced because I've, I've, I can point to a number of my colleagues flying high. You know, you, you look at the mayor of Detroit like that level of open arrogance, it'll take you down. I mean, you, you don't make friends that way. And I think the other part of it is that, you know, you it's so easy to fall. Like it's so easy. It, it one simple thing, you know, and, and if, if that is your person that people see, there, there is no grace in that. Like people just assume, yep, that's who this character is. And so, yep, it's not a mistake. It's not an accident. It's not an oversight. It's his intent. And you know, the other thing is I realize above everything else, and this is one of the things I learned growing up in a tough community amongst, amongst a bunch of guys that are fairly brilliant. I can't tell you how many of the guys I grew up with um, who could smoke pot all night long and outthink half of the people I did my doctor with. Seriously. You mean the devil's lettuce is not a bad thing? Listen, <laughs> you know, I make no, I make no public advocacy for it. I'm just saying, you know, the, the fact is that they, they can do it, and and I mean, just outthink half of the people I know, because they learn to think on their feet quickly, and they had to. But the reality is, is that I realized that it didn't have to be me. Like mm -hmm. every day, I thank God because it didn't have to be me. Like out of thousands of kids, it didn't have to be me. I counted all the grace, and so, you know. I realized that in all of my doings, it, it wasn't that there, there was a there was a lot of people put in my path. Um, right from right from high school, you know, in my TED talk, you hear me talk about these two, Amy and Barbara, like 
they gave their time because they believed in us and they helped us to see places we couldn't see. And so, you know, from my standpoint, I think that if you, again, if you fool yourself into thinking that this is all you're doing, there's a long road to hoe, as my mother would say. <laughs> well, you got to keep us posted on that book because I'll be dying to read that. I, I, I think my mom has played a pivotal role. I know I know Tyler will admit Martha's uh, played a big role in his life as well. <laughs> so um, it's funny how uh, our mothers, um, funny story on that. And before we get into the interview questions, because I just, you're a father, so you'll get this. And my buddy and I were taking our sons for a walk the other day. This woman was so blown away to see two fathers walking with their children without the mothers that she stood out of her way, stopped us, thanked us, praised us. And I was just so taken back by that is like, really, like, this is that surprising. That's almost sad in this environment where we are today that that fathers aren't celebrated as much as we are. And by no means I'm taking a, a swipe at women because I, I now see my wife as a superhero. But it's sad that us as men, if we continue to tie ourselves so much into our careers that we lose focus of what's really important. And we start to make those assumptions like you had mentioned as well, Dr. Jones. They received your application to come work for us here at Time Out for Leaders. <laughs> And we'd like to just ask you a couple uh, a couple interview questions just to see how uh, a gentleman of your stature um, would answer these questions to see if we actually want to bring you on as an employee here at Time Out with Leaders. So Tyler, what to, uh, what question do you have uh, for, for, for Dr. Jones today? Well, Dr. Jones, thanks for your uh, applying for uh, you know, a role at Time Out with Leaders here. If you could do anything in the world knowing that you weren't going to fail at it, what would it be? I would figure out how to build a world economy that was much more equitable. Love that. And when you figure that out, remember us, because we'll help champion that for you. <laughs> we we yeah. would certainly be rich together. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure trickle-down economics is not the answer like you said earlier. <laughs> or lead Six Sigma. <laughs> Um, my interview question, um, because obviously we, we, we kind of talked about um, the, the opportunities that people are given, right? Some, some people are handed a business and, and they get to run that business, but they've never felt what it's like to work on the other side. Um, we have those assumptions that you mentioned. If I could give you $10 billion tomorrow, but you could not spend a single cent on yourself, Dr. Jones, what are you spending that money on and why? Man, I tell you, in my job, I would love to have $10 billion. I can, I can. <laughs> well, you got 50 million. But <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, if I, if I had that much money, I would really um, invest it in, in working with people to make sure that, um, that we, that we in a deliberate and intentional way, move people to a foundational place where where they can build to their own potential. And, and I, th I think I would be clear um, that that's, that's not about giving people things, right? It's not about creating more entitlements. It's about really creating meaningful ways that, that level the playing, playing field so that people can build upon that with self-determination. And I know we're at the end of the episode, but that's too good to, to, to stop on right there. So, so when you, when you talk about, when you talk about that potential and that foundation and those things like that, and not giving things to people, right? I can comfortably tell you that in conversations with some of those central centralized figures that are, are, are really focused on what they have. I mean, I've heard it in business meetings, we give them everything. Why, 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 why well, they, everybody has the same opportunities that we have. So what the hell do Tyler and I say to those people when they say those, those, those types of things? You know what? I, I think, I think you, I think you, you broached a part that's important for us to move the discussion away from minorities, right? Because, and I know I'm going to be controversial in this comment, the anger and fury that's going on is not, it, it's kind of misplaced. You know, I lived in the Midwest and people are angry because they feel left behind. Being, they're being left behind doesn't mean that somebody else is getting a benefit. Like we, we've, we've conditioned people to believe that, that you're poor because this other person is getting a benefit. Mm -hmm. Not so, not so. And the reality is, is that there's a, the, the people in the country are getting poor and poor 
and it's not just people of color. It's it's white men that are getting poor and poor. And that's not about giving somebody anything. Look at things like, you know, remember, look for the union label when you are buying. Blah, blah. You, know, that, you know, I remember that as a kid. That The whole point of that was around encouraging people to buy American, right? But we love cheap. We love that T-shirt that you can get three for $10 that's manufactured somewhere else. It's not Black people that are stealing jobs. Manufacturing is offshore. And so the reality is, is that this pitting one group against the next one is bad in and of itself. The reality is, is that none of those people are really making decisions. And for those who those who take the stance that that people are given what they need, you know, I say to people oftentimes, if you really believe that, unenroll your kid from the private school and send them to the school I went to. And tell me about equity. Hmm. Unenroll them from the private school. Unenroll them from the suburban school and send them to the school I went to. And then tell me about equity. Yeah. Not that anybody owes you anything, but if you're going to be the author of declaring equity. I love that. Well, let's get a bus and let's start some field trips, Dr. Jones. <laughs> I think I think that's my best way to, to, to bring some understanding. It's funny. I heard somebody once say, if, if you don't think that there's a challenge with with being a minority, how many, raise your hands, by show of hands, how many of you want to be black? Yeah, but in all in all seriousness, like I, I've got a, you know, even in my TED talk, I'm always careful to mm-hmm. talk about the, to talk about the little white girl or boy who lives in the Boot Hills of Missouri. They've got a snowball chance at hell. And the important thing is that people have to remember that as a society, we're all interconnected. So if you leave enough people behind, that are black or white or Latino or Asian, we have a bigger problem. You can't continue to leave that many people behind and not have a disenfranchisement yes. over this belief that the American dream still exists. That is the mo- that was what motivates people to aspire. And so if you leave too many people behind, we all have a problem. And so it's not, while, the, while I agree that there are issues of race, the reality is, is that there's far too many people left behind. I've lived in states where I look at people and I'm thinking, so I, to be honest about it, I remember moving to one state and I won't, I won't say and blast the state, but I remember thinking to myself, wow, if this is, if this is, if this, when I see abject poverty, I'm talking about rural poverty, I remember thinking to myself, if white people are this poor and they're doing that bad, hell, it's a long way to go. Hmm. And believe me, it's not the picture that everybody paints. And I think this is some of the reason why people are angry, because there are people who are white that are poor. Mm. And we've painted this out to be a characterization where the only poor people are people of color. Mm-hmm. We got to get better about that. Uh, I know I am so grateful for your time, uh, Dr. Jones. It was uh, amazing to have you on here talking about some, some real things. Uh, we appreciate you joining us because... Leaders like you are just not a dime a dozen. They're hard to find. Um, and uh, I appreciate you uh, willing to, to accept our offer to come out with us on, on Time Out for, with Leaders. For sure. Thank you guys for having me. I think you guys are doing a great work. <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Jones.